This is the redeemed Christian Church of God, Jesus House Barida, is abiding place. We are situated at number 30 Asani Street, close to Elijah Bus Stop, Barida, Lagos State, Nigeria. You are welcome to join any of our services, Tuesday Digging Deep by 6.30pm, Thursday Faith Clinic also by 6.30pm, and on Sunday by 7.30am or 9am. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on all our social media accounts on Facebook RCCG Jesus House Barriga, on Instagram at RCCG Jesus House Barriga. Come expectant and you'll be sure to share a testimony. Welcome to our Digging Deep service where we look deep into the Word of God. And this is the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Jesus House, Barriga. We are situated in Barriga, Lagos State, Nigeria. And this evening we shall be considering the topic, faith, dying faith. But before we begin, I would like us to bow our heads while we take this short prayer. Heavenly Father, King of Glory, we bless your holy name. We thank you for giving us yet again an opportunity to look into your word. Tonight, we pray for your wisdom and that you enlighten our heart, that you open our minds to the mystery of your words in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us with understanding, O oh God, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Once again, you are welcome to tonight's service. It is our Dignity Deep service where we we'll look deep into the word of God. And again, the topic is dying faith. I would like to take some definitions, and the first definition is um, what faith is itself. So the first de definition that I'll be taking will be taken from the English dictionary. Faith is defined by Merriam-Webster dictionary as follows: an allegiance to duty or a person, fidelity to one's promises, sincerity of intentions, belief and trust in and loyalty to God. Believe in the traditional doctrines of a religion. Firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Complete trust. And the third definition here says something that is believed especially with strong conviction especially a system of religious belief. And um, we will take a look at what the Bible defines as, as faith, or how the Bible defines faith. But before we do that, I would like us to also consider the other part of the topic, which is uh, dying. What do we mean by dying faith? What does it mean to keep faith alive? So we take our Bible text, which is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 18, from verse 1 to 8. And I would like to read it in the Amplified Version. For every other Bible text that will be taken, they will be taken majorly in KJV, which is the King James Version. But if there will be any translation that will be taken, I will indicate them. So, Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8, and I read, Now Jesus was telling the disciples a parable to make the point that, all, that at all times they ought to pray and not give up and lose at, saying, In a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and had no respect for man. There was a desperate widow in that city, and she kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice and legal protection from my adversary. Verse 4. For a time he would not, but later he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow continues to bother me, I will give her justice and legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will be an intolerable annoyance and she will wear me out. Then the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not our just God defend and avenge his elect, his chosen ones, 
who cry out to him day and night, will he delay in providing justice on their behalf? And verse 8, which is the last verse, I tell you that he will defend and avenge them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of persistent faith on the earth? So I would like us to pay close attention to the last verse, which is verse 8, and the question that Jesus Christ asked there, which is an expression of a concern. He asked, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of persistent faith on the earth? We see Jesus express concern if we would find such a persistent faith on earth when it comes. And this concern forms the basis for our study. And to respond to this concern, we'll be studying on faith, what faith is itself. How does faith die? And we'll look at examples of men and women in the Bible and why they are considered examples of faith. In this study, we will dwell on Hebrews 11's definition of faith and example of men and women of faith as given in Hebrews chapter 11. So what is faith? As I earlier said in the beginning part of this service, as we took the definition from Merriam-Webster, which is not so far from what the Bible calls faith, but then is not an exhaustive or a concise definition of faith. So I'd like us to look at the Bible and what the Bible calls faith. So we look at Hebrews 11.1, 1, but before we take that verse, I would like us to first look at Hebrews 10.38. So let us open our Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38, and I'll be reading from here. I'll read the A part, which says, Now the just shall live by faith. So now let us move to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, that says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. First, you will note, as we read in Hebrews 10, 38, that there was an ongoing discussion. For us to get a full knowledge of what the discussion was about, I would implore us that we read um, the later end of chapter 10 before proceeding into chapter 11 that now talks fully about faith. So, faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In this definition, there are two things that faith services. Faith talks about two things, or faith borders around two things. The things hoped for and the things not seen. When we hope for a thing, it is faith that gives it substance. Whatever it is that we are hoping for, it is faith that gives it substance. Yes, that thing we are hoping for is not yet in the physical, but we are expecting it. But what substantiates that hope is the faith. The work that we put in substantiates the faith that we have. Faith is seen in the things we do while we wait. And the examples that we give of men and women of faith um, later will, will really touch point on this particular one. And also, things not seen, which is the second thing that faith borders on. Things that are not seen Faith provides evidence for them. We cannot see God, but yet we believe, right? If you are asked by someone, do you know God? How can you prove that God, God exists? Our belief is the evidence that God exists. Even though we cannot see him, but the belief that we have in him and the things that our belief pushes us to do tell us the person that asks or the person that may want to ask you to give an evidence of God tells the person that God exists and then the result that comes afterwards really proves to the person that indeed God exists. So how does faith die? We said the topic is dying faith. We've talked about faith. We've given the definition of faith and we talked about the concern that Jesus Christ expressed when when he gave a, a parable about the woman that, that had an issue and was bothering the judge about her issue. Jesus Christ expressed a concern if he would 
find such a persistent fit by the time it comes back. So riding on this, um, these two, faith being kept alive and faith itself, we now want to ask, how does faith die? When we look at the account of James, in um, James chapter 2, verse 18 to 26, James chapter 2, verse 18 to 26, and I'll read from here. It says, Here a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But with thou know, O vain man, the devil also believe. Um, sorry, I'll take that again. Verse 20. But we thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the Earl of justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So that is taken from the book of James chapter 2, 18 to 26. This that we have read in the book of James, chapter 2, 18 to 26, is very profound. And you may want to ask, now that we have talked about faith, we have given definition of faith, we have talked about Jesus' Jesus's concern about meeting faith, meeting a persistent faith when it comes back, and we have talked about faith being dead without work. So we may want to ask ourselves, where do I stand in all of this? What does this knowledge help me achieve? Or how does it help me in any way to know about dying faith? But then I would like to ask us a question. Have you been faithful in paying your vows? And have you been faithful in paying your tithe? Yes, you have the question. How does living faith or dying faith affect me in any way? But I will use two, two of these, which, is, which I consider to be universal to every Christian to explain what a living faith and a dying faith is. Take vow, for instance. When you make a pledge, you make it to God. Something prompted you to make the pledge, right? And then you pledge, went ahead and made the pledge. But pledging doesn't stop at you making the pledge. It's completed when you redeem the vow that you have made to God. But for one who doesn't redeem their vow, there are two things that that person must have been thinking in their mind. One of which is that which I have trusted God for was not done by God. It was just sheer luck that brought it to me. And the other thing that they may have thought about is yeah, this thing that I have promised God, God may not really care about it if I don't redeem my vow. Which goes to say that there may be no God. So the person first doesn't believe in God and also doesn't believe that God is capable of rewarding or rewarding people who diligently seek him. Right? Also, Titan, a, a perfect example of um, living faith or dying faith is, in, is seen in how faithful we are with our Titan. And Malachi 3.10 summarizes it, and I would like to read it for us here. Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. Now this is a command from God. That there may be meat in my house, and prove me now here with. It says, We prove him with this, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall be no room enough to receive it. Now, taking this Bible verse that I just read to us and 
our disposition and faithfulness in giving our tithe. God gave a promise that is going to bless us abundantly if we bring into a storehouse, right? But for someone who is not faithful with their tithing, the person is indirectly saying that the promise that God has given, it's either that God won't fulfill that promise or the person absolutely does not believe that there is a God in the first place. So now that we have talked about what dying faith is or what faith that is alive is, we now want to give, uh, give ex examples of men and women in the Bible that exhibited faith, that had faith in God. And like I said earlier, these examples will be taken from Hebrews 11. So the first person that we are going to study is Abel. And we will look at Hebrews 11.4. And I will read to us from here. Hebrews 11.4. It says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. That's Hebrews 11 verse 4. Examining the above scripture, we will see that an action was performed. He offered unto God. And like I said earlier, faith without work is dead. Faith without performing an action to substantiate the faith that we proclaim is dead. I would like to take us back to where the original event happened, which is in Genesis. So I'll read Genesis chap chapter 4 verse 2 to 7 which gives an account of what Abel did and what Cain did which will help us better understand the actions that Abel took which um, counted for him as having faith in God so I read Genesis chapter 4 2 to 7 starting from 2 and she again bare his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground and in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord and Abel he also brought of the first limbs of his flock and of the fat thereof and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell and the Lord said unto Cain why art thou wrought, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Let us pay close attention to verse 3 and 4. And I would like to read that to us in the Amplified Version. Verse 3 says, And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And verse 4, which talks about how Abel brought his own offering. But Abel brought an offering of the finest firstborn of his, of his flock and the fat portions. And the Lord had respect. He had regard for Abel and his offering. Now, looking at the two characters here, Cain, I want to say Cain just looked around, checked his store to see what was available and brought to God. But looking at Abel, he says he brought an offering of the finest firstborn of his flock for people who rear cattle. I would want to believe that it actually takes diligence to keep track of cattle, which cattle is giving birth to which. So now be able to tell which is the firstborn of which cattle. So I want to point to uh, how careful Abel was in choosing the offering that he brought as against what Cain brought. It feels to me that Cain just looked around after harvesting, just looked around probably it was out of remnants that I brought to God. Even though it's not stated in, in, in the Bible we read, but the, the feeling of the text as we read it, comparing Cain 
and Abel. It was as if Cain just looked around and picked what was available at the time and brought to God. As against how careful Abel was in choosing his offering. So Abel gave an offering of the finest firstborn of his flock and the fat portion. He was very careful and he was intentional about what he was going to do. And what does that translate to when we are considering faith and work? Cain was relaxed in his options. He just gave, probably as a tradition that was passed down to him by his father. He gave without an expectation, without considering that God is a faithful God who rewards those who diligently seek him. But in the case of Abel, he gave something substantial. And why would one want to give something substantial? The only reason would be that let me give what is good because this God is a good God. Let me give what is good because this God is living. Let me give what is good because I'm very sure he's going to reward me. Let me give what is good because that which I have now, he gave to me. It comes from a heart realizing that there is a God. There is a faithful God and there is a God who rewards. And that is the distinction between Cain and Abel. Cain's faith was without work. Abel's faith was with work, a diligent one. He was careful and intentional about what he gave. Our, our second example that we look at is Abraham. And we look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 8 to 10. Hebrews 11, 8 to 10. And I read to us, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out. Not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had no foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Now, action was taken by Abraham when God asked him to leave his country. That action is a step of faith. There would be others who would hear the same instruction but they will say, oh, I have heard of God, but will not take action. They will think about what they are leaving behind. They will think about the comfort they will be leaving behind. They will even think about the fact that where God is taking them to, he has not even told them. And for that excuse, they will say, oh, let me wait until God tells me where he is taking me to. At least God should tell me where he is taking me to before I leave. But Abraham did not wait for all of that. He heard the instruction to leave and he left. God gave him a description of where he's taking him to find, but the location was not disclosed. So Abraham just stood and left out of faith. Verse 9 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. And this did not just stop with him at least from what we read in uh, verse 9. The type of life they lived continued with Isaac and even until Jacob's time. And what was that type of life? They lived in tents. They lived in tabernacles. Even though Abraham was rich enough to build houses, I mean, we, we have accounts in the Bible that shows us how rich he was. There was a time he, he went to war, took spoils, and gave 10% of it to Melchizedek. It showed that he was rich, which, which means that he could have actually built a city. But because there is a promise that God has given him, and there is a sojourning that is required of him, he didn't say, yes, I am blessed now. Now I can build a country for myself. God told him that where I'm taking you to is going to be built by, by me for you. So he continued to look for a city which had foundations already, whose builder and maker is God, not a country that he himself, Abraham, built. He continued to live in tents and waited on the promise that God gave him. 
And even if we look at how the promise came to be, Abraham had no children even until his old age before he had Isaac. Although we know that a lot of things happened in between the time that God gave the promise and for him to have Isaac, Agar came into the, the picture. Then Ishmael was given birth to. But Isaac eventually came. But even when Isaac came, God still demanded of him that he give up Isaac as a sacrifice. And Abraham, he did, even when he was so obvious that this Isaac that I, that I have given you is the child of the promise that I made earlier with you. He wasn't reluctant in giving up Isaac. Why? He believed God. So, again, to recap, what were the actions taken by, by Abraham? He went out of his own country, not knowing where he was going. He dwelt in tabernacles with Isaac, even down to Jacob. They dwelt in tents, not having houses built with foundations, even though they could afford to build such houses. They lived a nomadic life. Then he looked forward continuously for a city that was built by God. And what other interesting fact can we learn from Abraham's faith? He bore Isaac at an old age, but he waited still and kept on believing. Even though the news was brought to Sarah at some point that this time um, in, the, in, in, in the course of human time, Sarah is going to give birth to a son. And Sarah laughed about it. Why would he laugh anyway? Because it's hard to believe that at such old age, Sarah will still give birth. But Abraham believed still and held on to the faith. Like I mentioned earlier, Isaac is seen to be the promised child. But Abraham was not hesitant in giving him up as sacrifice because he believed still that, yes, God who made the promise is capable of fulfilling the promise. And that is faith in action. He acted by not staying back home when he was given the instruction to give up Isaac as a sacrifice. He loaded his servant up and they went ahead to go and sacrifice Isaac. That is work being put into play. That is action. That is acting on a belief and not just sitting back. So the other example that I would like us to consider is um, Enoch. And we will read about Enoch's um, faith exploit in Hebrews 5, Hebrews 11, 5. And I'll read to us from here. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We all believe with me that God is unseen. We can't see God with our physical eyes. And for someone like Enoch to have pleased an unseen God, it must have been faith. He believed that God existed even though he couldn't see God. He believed in the existence of God. And this is accounted as faith. If you think about it for, for a moment, how is it possible to stay diligent to one's master? Let's say uh, you have a master and then master travels. How is it so easy to stay diligent? Even when the master says, oh, I'm not coming back. This traveling, I'm traveling and giving everything to you. One may resolve to, oh, Yes, my master has given me everything. Now I can do as I wish. It was almost the same case for Enoch. He hadn't seen God before, but he stayed diligent and pleased God in the process. And God took him. We see his testimony. He said, for before his translation, he had this testimony he, that he pleased God. Enoch walked with God, even though he didn't see God. Another example that I would like us to look at is Noah. And I'll read the book of Hebrews again, chapter 11, verse 7. Hebrews 11, verse 7. It says, By faith, Noah, being one of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, 
by the which he condemned the world and became peer of righteousness, which is by faith. Hebrews 11 verse 7. Again, this is more or less similar to what Enoch went through. Noah got a warning and acted upon the warning. For someone to embark on such a big project as building an ark, building a big ship that would house one's family and house thousands of animals at the same time, it must have been resource intensive. And this action was only based on the warning that God gave him of what is coming. Even though he didn't see it, he didn't see what was coming, but God warned him that something is coming and he acted upon it. He put effort into it. It took him years to build this because I would assume that he built it all by himself, maybe including his family and his in-laws. But to have been able to build such a huge ship that will contain so much animal, it must, it must have taken years. I mean, years of discouragement, years of being laughed at, years of being discouraged by people because people just kept on carrying on with parties. It now seemed that Noah was being crazy, but Noah didn't relent. He put all that he had into building that ship. And we all know where the story ended. God wiped the whole earth. Everybody dies. Animals, plants, every, everything was wiped out, save for Noah. Because he believed, he had faith, and he substantiated his faith with work. He didn't just stop at hearing God. He didn't just say, okay, God, at which point in time is this that we are talking about is going to come to pass so that I can prepare myself when the time is close. He heard the warning and then he did with action. He took action and he was saved, him and his household. So having considered these um, four examples, we talked about Rahab briefly as well. Rahab took action in, in um, hiding the spies that Israel sent over. That's action based on faith because he knows, uh, because Rahab knew that at some point Israelites are going to overcome and based on that, she acted helping because of the Israelites. We, read, we, we talked about Enoch as well. We talked about Noah. We talked about Abel. We talked about Cain and Abel and their sacrifices. We talked about our father, Abraham. And we talked about uh, the generation that the promise of God to Abraham spanned before it even came to pass. And yes, one of the funny things about Abraham's um, um, faith is that even that which was promised to him, he didn't get to see it, but he believed still. He didn't get to see it. It, it didn't happen in his own lifetime. It did not happen in his own lifetime, but his belief, his faith was not shaken at any point in time. So in conclusion, faith will be dead if one does not apply himself to the work required in line with the hope that lies ahead. Faith will be dead if there is no work. Yes, you may have received the revelation, you may, you may have seen or you may have received a prophecy, but what are you doing with the prophecy? What are you doing with the revelation? Are you applying yourself to the required work? Are you believing totally that you are inspired to apply yourself to the work that is required by that which you have heard by means of revelation or that which you have received by prophecy? Here again are examples of those who kept faith alive and how they did it. First, we, we have Noah, who trusted God and built an ark for the salvation of his household. We have um, Abraham, who trusts God and leaves his homeland for an unknown place of promise. Then we have Abraham, again, who trusts God, living in tents instead of building, even when he had the resources to actually build a city. It was prosperous. He could have, but then he waited and relied entirely on the promise that God has given him even though he had the wherewithal to actually bring pass, bring to pass this promise that God has given, but he waited still with hope and expectation of that which God has given him. 
So tonight I would like us to pray some few prayers to help us strengthen our faith. Even for someone who does not believe, God can help you. God can help your unbelief. For someone who does not have faith, there's nothing too difficult for our God to do. So I would like you to pray this evening. You say, Father, help me to build faith and trust in you. Help me to, to believe in you totally. Even when I have unbelief or when I doubt, help me, O oh God, that I will keep focus on you alone and believe entirely on the word you have given on the promises you have given in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Secondly, I would like us to pray that every revelations and prophecies that we have received of God, every word that we have received of God and we are waiting on, that God help us with strength to keep waiting when we need to wait. And God fills us with the strength to work when we need to work out this faith in the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Once again, I would like to thank us for joining this service. And as a way of announcement, we should subscribe to these um, channels, whatever channels you are watching us on or listening to us on. If you are listening on MixLR, you should fo follow us on MixLR. If you are listening or watching on Instagram, follow us on Instagram. Uh, you can follow us as well on YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook as well. Also, I would like to use this opportunity to implore us to give our offering. The offering details will be given at the end of this service. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We recognize you as our Father. We know that you are faithful. Faithful to reward those who diligently seek you. Father, be the exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for wisdom that you have given us. We thank you for understanding of your word that you have given us today. Be the exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we have learned of way of as we have learned of faith and ways to apply our faith, tonight we pray, Lord, that we shall not be faithless anymore. That the work that is required of us to really show our faith, that we'll be able to embark on it in the mighty name of Jesus the actions and steps that we need to take to really prove that we have faith in you. Help us to take in the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' name we have prayed.